Huzzah Rangers. This is your boy Phil Harris here at the Jacks Rangers show. Diamond Dave is here with us. Dave, how the hell are you? I'm doing pretty good. Yeah, Phil pound it. <laughs> that does make me feel slightly better. Um, you know, coming into the episode here prior to us going live, I was telling Dave, I'm just angry. You know, I've went through the phases of being in disbelief, sad on the pitch when I'm talking to players and other fans uh coaches as well and now i'm just angry and we'll get into it all in one moment i'm going to mention our sponsor our lovely sponsor you can see their logo down below there of course this episode is sponsored by inkify custom printing and embroidery since 2010 inkify provides high quality decorated apparel nationwide from ordering the apparel to printing adding a private label folding bagging and fulfillment they handle it all so you don't have to. Visit Inkify.com to get started on your order and tell them TJRS sent you, and you'll get 15% off of your entire order, and that is a hell of a deal. All right. First and foremost, before we get into what actually took place on the pitch, let's talk about the Champtoberfest, which was all in all a great experience. You know, the Free Jacks returning home to Fort Quincy. Um, celebrating the victory that took place and the MLR final there in Chicago, which was awesome. Um, remember a few weeks back, Dave, I had posted what's in the box, that gimmick. Uh, with, with the banners being unveiled, the mystery has finally been revealed. Now, once those banners came down there and were unveiled, I immediately went on social media and posted uh, my little surprise uh, and what that was is the authentic championship banners are here at the Granite Outpost. I think most people thought, well, well, he just borrowed them, uh, and they have them there at the, hanging up. But that's not necessarily the case. Um, there were two banners printed for each championship. I have this one right here. This is the Eastern Conference Final here that I'll be hanging back up. This is the real McCoy. It's not a replica. Um, so I've got... The Free Jacks have their pair, and I have mine here at the Granite Outpost, which is really, really cool. I'm not going to tell you how I got those. Uh, sometimes little birdies give me information and give me things, and I appreciate them very, very much. All the Rangers out there, you guys are awesome. Let's just say that. But, uh, yeah, shout out to all the Rangers, by the way, who dressed up in their German-style costumes. The tailgate, the famous tailgate at this point for the New England Free Jacks was full. Uh, I arrived about an hour prior to kickoff. Uh, Miss TJRS and I, um, you know, we arrived, we were talking to everybody, had a blast. Dave, what was your experience pregame? Uh, kind of similar. We we came in hot about an hour before kickoff, which for me is coming in hot. I always like to be there forever ahead of yeah. time. But had a good time circulating around the tailgate for the first real time mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and meeting people there. Certainly going to be swinging through many more times this season. Looking forward to Saturday. Mm-hmm. Um, Saw Ethan Fryer up there playing yep, Cornhole. He's got a got a cast on his wrist, you know. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Unfortunate for a, him. A little bit of a bummer, but he'll be back at it in no time, I'm sure. He was in really good spirits. Good. And we were there with a friend of mine and uh, his daughter. And she's good friends with my daughter, Abby. Mm -hmm. And she broke her arm, I think, maybe wrist, skiing oh, wow. recently. So she also has a cast on her wrist okay. so we got a great like cast buddies photo love that you know with them and he was a really good sport about it you know um so it was it was a lot of fun there at the tailgate it's great to see players kind of hobnobbing on their you know when they don't have duties to right yeah complete that day often they're working but you that's know, right yeah they don't need a hundred percent of the guys no. every weekend so guys get some weekends off too it seems so great to see them kicking around uh, inside the venue, man, it felt so good to walk back into Veterans Memorial Stadium 100%. in Quincy. Uh, I mean, what a great vibe. As soon mm -hmm. as you walk in, you recognize people. You're saying hello. I saw Dan the moment I walked in. Uh, yeah, I hadn't seen boy. him. Yep. So I said hey to Dan. Caught my buddy Wes. We went and got some food. Uh, the Lederhosen were great. All the various German costumes. You know, yeah. most of them are... are you know, Amazon buys, right? I and, saw and some it, authentic ones, though, but, like some real deal. 
that's yeah. what I was gonna say. A couple people were repping the, and you, they live for that, man. Hell if yeah, you dude. own that outfit, legit, you are just every day you're hoping for an excuse to bust that out. <laughs> so it was, Absolutely. it was really fun. It was a good theme. Um, the banner ceremony itself, I thought, was really well done. Very well they, done. Uh, yeah, they had everything set up and good to go. It went off without a hitch. That's really all you can ask for, right? Hundred percent, man. Like yeah. ultimately, you know, the Free Jacks always do a fantastic job in putting on those festivals, and this is just one another example of that. Really, really happy with the result. I wasn't involved in the beer fest, but that looked full as well. That's another encouraging thing. Yeah. Is that you know they try to pull people through the door with other different things other than just rugby, and the beer fest are seem to be very, very successful. There's going to be another one of those this weekend, which is really, really cool. Um, yeah, the music was fantastic. It was on brand, right, for the actual theme. Uh, the, yeah. The music prior to the game which was awesome so yeah just just great vibes all around you know celebratory you know we won the championship the banners got uh, you know raised up or lowered down in this case and it was just yep. it was just great it was great great pregame it always is at the free jacks at fort quincy um i did want to talk about the halftime show really quickly yes. here because obviously we're just delaying the inevitable here we're just <laughs> dragging our feet um I guess, you know, I wanted to mention that uh, Spider, Loki, and I uh, were were selected or chosen, however the hell they do it, um, to be members on the, uh, the front line in Section 5 to daringly choose to participate in the relay race at halftime, uh, hosted by our guy Wheels, of course. Uh, there was hurdles, spins, a pitcher of water, which Wheels called something else that confused the hell out of us, like a stein maybe or something a like stein, that. stein, yeah. That's it, yes. Was. I thought he was talking about like the one of those things you get on your eye. Sty. Sty. <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about, Val? Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, so that confused all of us. Uh, and of course, the kicking that took place at the end, uh, not my finest moment. But uh, at first I was like, nah, I don't really want to do this. But then I was like, you know what? I'm going to just be vulnerable and, you know, ha just have fun because part of the branding of the show, even though I'm kind of like strict and like, let's keep it, <laughs> keep it moving. There's an element of this is just very, very fun. Have fun. All of that sort of stuff. Be funny. So I was like, yeah, you know what? Let's just do it. I'll make a fool of myself in front of thousands of people. Why not? Um, so I knew right away that I was not going to be galloping with that hobby horse. Like I was like, yeah, that's not going to happen. So um, through the hurdles, not bad, not bad at all. Yeah. The, the, I started strong. I you mean, took I, what a very strong lead? Yeah, I sure did. I mean, what did it look like like from the stands? Uh, pretty good. I mean, you really busted through the hurt. Honestly, it looked like uh, the other guys weren't weren't even trying. You know, I think you, I think you maybe <laughs> wounded their pride with uh, uh... the speed with which you came out of the gate. Um, cause by the time you got to the end of the hurdles, they picked up their pace a little bit. They, they were, did. uh, they were, trying they were to like, up. Oh, it's, it's, we're really doing this. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, listen, man, I mean, it's all fun and games, but I used to be a collegiate athlete. You know, That's I was right. not, I wasn't terrible at, I wasn't great, but I wasn't bad at rugby. So, um, yeah, I've got a little bit of athleticism, not much, but just a little bit, just um, enough. Just, just enough. enough. And then the kicks came about and that didn't go as well. Like, here's the thing is like when you're a North Carolina boy and you you discover rugby, your friends are like, oh, this is kind of cool. But ultimately, you're just passing the ball to yourself and you can't really do that. Um, so I did a lot of kicking when I was growing up. So I was like, I fancied myself in that mm -hmm. drop kick. I was like, I can do this. But I gave it zero power. And I think that's because like when I was a kid, like I didn't want to kick it too far because I would have to go get it. Right. So right. I, I really do think that like I, I could I could have eaten it it had it, it was accurate but it just didn't have the power right That's like right. it went five feet it, and it was it embarrassing harder. you got to hit it harder. That's the thing. Is, yeah, you, you've got the follow through, but you got to make sure that you put some power behind it. So that's, that's right. my that was my fatal flaw. But yeah, um, so we've stalled talking about the game long enough. Uh, so let's get right into it, I suppose. This is coming. Well, off. I was going to mention just one other thing. Go right ahead. The, the um, section five or not section five, but first uh, regiment. Mm -hmm. Let's ride, which was pretty great. John yeah, that Payne was good. And myself and. You know, my daughter and uh, I think his son, his father-in-law, if I remember right, Barb. Okay. Just kind of a, a nice assortment of different people, um, all people who've been around for a while. Kenny set it up. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, it was, you know, it was great. It felt like an honor to be out there and to, to give that let's ride it was really exciting i kind of lingered on the field as much i was like john you, <laughs> john, you go ahead being a very gentlemanly you, right you go right ahead john you go right ahead hilarious and uh uh 
waited, you know, just kind of like looking around, like, man, I'm like 12 feet away from this wing who is about to chase this kick. Like the kickoff <laughs> is this yeah. far away. It is the next thing that's happening in this right, stadium. Right. And I'm like, for this moment, I'm right there. It was very exciting. So yeah, man. It was a lot of fun. And then they kicked off. And then yeah. there, was a rug- there was a rugby game, too. Started out pretty well, I will say that. Uh, let's did. see what our boy Brian Ray and company say here with their article that I'm pulling the information from. Let me actually get this over to the side here so I can actually see it. Um, because if you guys don't know, like I've got – you know, a, a holding thing in front of me here. So it kind of cuts the my screen in half. So I need to move this over. All right. What it says in Jason Robertson, it that their old glory is very lucky to have him back, by the way. Uh, yeah, conversion okay. with extra time or with time expired gave old glory DC an unlikely 25 or excuse me, 35 to 34 win over the New England Free Jacks at Fort Quincy on Saturday afternoon. It's so crazy the adoption of Fort Quincy. Um, you know, we, we came up with these concepts of what we should call uh, Veterans Memorial Stadium in Fort Quincy um, mm-hmm. was like the major one that we came up with. And now it's just everybody calls it Fort Quincy now. Like the entire MLR pundits, everybody, the team, everybody calls it Fort Quincy. It's pretty cool. Uh, the visitors overcame a 15-point second-half deficit to bring a halt to New England's 14-game winning streak that dated back to last season. It was the Free Jacks who got on the board first, and it didn't take long. The try came from a well-executed set move with Cam Davidowitz breaking from a mall and feeding a pop pass to John Poland on his inside. When it happened, I was like, ooh, trick play here. This is fun to watch. Um, the scrum half needed only to fix the last defender to free Paula Bellincana for a try in the left corner. Jason Patras hit the conversion from wide out to make it a full seven. Another three points went up courtesy of Patras on a penalty kick soon after. The New England defense repelled a promising DC attack and then capitalized on a mistake. John Rizzo... Uh, couldn't handle the high ball from Patras, and Reese McDonald was quickest to react, bolting 40 meters untouched to score with the conversion, making it 17 to nil to the home side. And I think people were like, okay, this is yeah. what we expected from our New England Free Jacks, the, the champions of MLR from 2023. Right. They're in, they're already in mid season form. Uh, and by the way, Reese McDonald, like, it was a lucky bounce. But I mean, to, for him to get that ball and run in, like that's what was it? That's four tries in two games yep. from the Red Rocket. Super impressed with his play coming into 2024. Yeah. Um, the visitors finally opened up their account with a multi-phased attack off a lineout. Robertson tied up two defenders on the game line and popped to Martin. Is it Vaca? You think that's Martin uh, Vaca? Uh, Vaca, the hook. Vaca, yes, Vaca. Ooh. Vaca. Ooh. Okay. Uh, in support, the Argentine hooker stepped off his left foot and fended his way to the uh, line for a try. There was no trouble for Robertson with the conversion to make it a 10 point game. With a few short minutes later, and that gap closed uh, was closed to three. Ben Lesage was warned for repeat high tackles, and DC took full advantage with a long kick to the corner. Uh, the drive was initially sh- slowed by Vaca. Um, but he spotted a weakly guarded short side and burst from the back to grab his double. Robertson nailed the extras from the sideline, and the partisan crowd were suddenly silent. I mean, I think that's fair to say. I mean, we were surprised a little bit with, you know, D.C. just kind of hung around at certain points in this game. They, they kind of roared back. It also says New England brought the fans back into the game with their own score from a driving mall, an offside penalty against D.C. conceded field position, and the drive was executed to perfection with Andrew Quatran getting uh, credit for the try. The kick from Patras made it 24-14 to the home side at the half. I will say it looks like Q had a, a huge contingent of family members that came down from uh, Ontario or Toronto, uh, to be specific, uh, to see him play, which was really, really cool. Uh, they were all wearing pink Q beanies, which was nice. Nice little touch there. Uh, but what was your what were your thoughts at halftime? You know, felt felt pretty good. It was DC was certainly in it, but going ahead by seventeen, scoring like two minutes in, right? Yeah, two or three minutes is very quick. Yeah, that ball kind of score. Um, 
it felt good. You know, I, I, you mentioned everybody kind of feeling like, yep, these are the free jacks. This is what we do. Yes. You know, dare I say we took it for granted a little bit, maybe that we were yes. we were that much better than everybody and just gonna gonna walk all over DC. Hundred percent. Um, uh, they certainly didn't seem to agree with that. That's right. I mean, they they came out with belief. And they wanted to get that that monkey off their back. I mean, it had been 149 days, or excuse me, 1,049 days since the last time that they had beat the New England Free Jacks. Um, almost two full years um, since they had beaten the New England Free Jacks. So, you know, when you're when you've got that type of goal in front of you, it's it's easy to you know get motivated and up for a game where you're consistently called the little brothers in the red, white, and blue by this show. And, and not just this show, like other people clearly understand that the New England Free Jacks are a better franchise on the pitch than DC is. Um, and, and you just look at the overall record between the two, right? I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't take a genius to figure that out, but you know, they had belief. And that's something that every single team that we will face in this league this year is going to have that belief that like we will play up to this opponent because they're the champions and we want to knock them off of their perch. So that's something that we're going to have to adjust to as specifically the team. Uh, when I say the Royal, we is as what I'm referring to the club will have to adjust to that. Um, it says early in the second half an off the ball scuffle led to the referee lecturing both captains about discipline from an ensuing scrum. A set play was orchestrated and a brilliant no look pass from Bellincona found McDonald who in turn fed Mitch Wilson on the outside. The winger, step back across the, the drifting defense to score a bonus point try for the free jacks and he definitely stepped right and it made the yeah. defender the first defender miss and he had so much momentum that he was just able to carry it through to the try line another beautiful try from iron man mitch wilson his first try of the season uh it didn't take long for the reply though from the visitors so again you know you've got a team that has belief and wants to beat the bigger brother so they're punching back consistently uh penalties gave away a attacking line out and uh vaca uh, uh vaca excuse me again tore off the back of the mall but this time he was met with two defenders robertson was next to have a crack stepping uh, past one and reaching out of the tackle to ground the ball for a try he converted his own to close the gap to eight points with half an hour to play. And, and I will say this about the crowd. It was a bit flat. I think it's partly due to one, the weather Two, It's the first home game. So you're, you're maybe a little bit more social in the stands, you know, talking to everybody. It's the first time that we're all together in that in Fort Quincy again. And maybe just the lull of, you know, well, we're playing DC and we got up really early against them and, just a lot of different factors you could say, but like the crowd was a little flat, a little delayed with certain mm -hmm. things. So, you know, that, that I guess that's just, uh, we'll chalk it up to opening day. Right. Um, let me yeah. see here. Well, and I think maybe a little of the taking it for granted, like I said, yeah. and, and yeah. maybe not everybody, but if you're listening, maybe you're like, hell no, I right. didn't take it for granted. I was losing my mind, you know, good for you. Yes. But, yeah. Um, I mean, I feel, I feel like we kind of ag agree on that read a little bit. We're mm -hmm. maybe approaching the same thing from two different angles. Exactly. Uh, yeah. The quiet crowd and just um, not, not quiet. I mean, it, it, but quieter than usual. It's quieter it's than usually usual. usually at, at an 11, you yes. know, it's really electric. 100%. And, um, you know, so maybe that's credit to DC for quieting the crowd. I mean, that's yeah. what they mean. That's what people mean when they say quiet the crowd, punch back. Yeah. And they were punching back. 100%. Like if you're if you're going uh, as an away team to a home venue, you want to take the crowd out of it. And they were pretty successful at certain points, not the entire game by any means. Like the crowd did come alive at certain points. And I was proud of that for sure. But they, they we the, the crowd was a bit silent at certain times. I think it was a little bit uh, we were stunned uh, to see yeah. DC to continue to fight. Um, all right. Just as quickly, the home side created their fifth try. McDonald attempted Grubber was deflected and Wilson was the man to regather, feeding it back to McDonald, speeding through the gap. Davidowitz took the pass down the sideline and offloaded to Lesage for the finish. In the background, another scuffle ensued. And again, the referee, unable to identify the instigator, um, told the two captains to knock it off, essentially. Um, 
I will say that they went back to the TMO and did a long, long TMO yes. uh, trying to figure out if that was a forward pass. It certainly did look like a forward pass on the Jumbotron, but it was deemed to be, you know, an, uh, acceptable and, and the try stood. The, yeah. And, and so this is where my notes start. 55 okay. minutes in. Let's go for uh, it. So after this match, you know, I really, I really started digging into um, the ending. From this point on, basically, we right, score right. our last points, and then what happens that allows DC to come back? And and what I what I noted here was, you know, great try. Um, Patros missed the conversion, putting mm -hmm. him at three for five for the day. Right, right. Um, Scott Green wanted to card a player from each team. He okay. was really clear to the TMO. I want the number of the first player from each team who ran into the scuffle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm going to give both of them a card, which is a good way to handle it. Um, they were not able to get numbers because of just the, the hubbub of the scuffle. And right. so after a couple minutes of trying, Scott Green finally said, forget it, we're not going to hold the game so that we can figure out who to card for running in. We're just going to move on. Right. And called the captains over and and gave both teams that warning for for afters which right. did for that did pretty much settle uh fighting for the rest of the game right it's so. one of those things where we we seen it last year the intensity and what i'm doing right now is trying to pull up uh, one of the comments from one of the listeners that wanted us to address a couple things uh i'll do that at the end of the article but um it's one of those things that we saw last year where this this it's a it's a legitimate rival these these two teams do not like each other so there's uh, there's quite a bit of off the ball stuff it yeah. just you know naturally when that occurs you got two teams that don't like each other there'll be some jersey grabbing and stuff like that that takes place so the referee is yeah. trying to establish um, who's in control, like he's trying to take control of the game by talking to the captains and then potentially giving out yellow cards for the argy-bargy stuff that takes place. So right. uh, not surprised, you know, the Free Jacks ultimately had a bit of discipline issues along with DC. You know, there are some people that are saying there are some penalties that weren't called the right way, but, you know, it, it, it is what it is. We'll get to the end of the, the game here in a moment, but um, definitely something to keep note of for the next game because it will be, it'll be hot. Uh, down there in DC, literally yeah. and figuratively, like symbolically and temperature wise. Uh, okay, where are we at in the. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Massage try, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a raking 5022 from Graydon Bowd put the visitors back to within striking range. Cole Keith was bent for a no arms tackle, and suddenly DC were knocking on the door. Uh, on came the pressure until uh, at last, uh, Veka. Vaca, excuse me, um, claimed his hat trick, the hooker burrowing over from close range with uh, Robertson kicking, ma uh, making it a one score game. Patros had a chance to stretch the lead, but his penalty attempt was off target. Uh, Old Glory then won a scrum penalty in advance, but were turned away by Danton Morgan uh, Puder Rangi. Um, intercept. Poland seemed to be pulling away when Bravaro uh, arrived to make a desperate try-saving tackle. With the clock now in the final minute, the referee lost his patience. Yellow to Sean Ralph, who's the young, promising uh, hooker from New Zealand for us, uh, for not rolling from a tackle. By the way, he was pinned in with his arms out like i can't do anything but you know i guess by he the letter the, of the he rolled the wrong way he tried to roll ah. north okay he, so he lands on the deck and you got to roll east west not north south right? okay that's why that's what you tell right what you tell players sure. so north south north would be back into the ruck mm -hmm. south would be out of the ruck into the scrum half who's trying to play the ball right so you you're gonna to be get rolling. dinged if you do either of those things so you need you to be rolling go on east, your side. West. Yeah. yeah, you gotta yeah. go you gotta go to one side or the other. You gotta go to move yeah. to the side of the ruck, not yeah. the not the back of the ruck. What Fair he enough. did, and and I don't I don't think that he was trying to slow the ball down because no. I think it would be a dumb time to be like, I'm gonna commit a penalty and maybe I'll Yeah, in the last the minute of the game, right. Right. So I don't think it was intentional. I think he kind of 
he thought he could get out if he rolled north and he couldn't they came in and rucked and he was pinned at that point Mm -hmm. but if he if he'd rolled east or west and been pinned i'm not saying he wasn't pinned but before he was pinned he rolled in the wrong direction which means it's on him totally Um, if he'd rolled east or west and then somebody had pinned him and brought him back in. I think you could make a case that, like, come on, he was pinned in. And refs are Fair. trying to look, trying to look for that. But um, yeah, he rolled back into the ruck. So that's like in that time. So when when Cole Keith gets penalized and yes. carded, right? Mm-hmm. J.R. Jenkinson comes back on. That's why you handle that. You have to have a front row. So so that's right. Cam went off. Cam Davidowitz went off to make room for J.R. Jenkinson to come on. Mm-hmm. So we're down a player for 10 minutes, and it's actually a flanker, even though a prop got uh, carded. Right. But that prop is a tired prop. And take nothing away from Jenkinson, he did pretty well for coming back on. A great scrummager. Um, he, yep. he made some good tackles. Like, he tackled Boney at one point. <laughs> you know, like, double double team tackle, helped, helped Vanderbank bring him down. Um, I mean, he was out there working hard, but he also, you know, one of these scrums in here, um, Jameson Fanana Schultz literally like points at him and just yell uh, like, like a captain would right points at an, at the opposition front row and just yells, he's tired. <laughs> oh, I mean, okay. and I'm, I'm sure it was true. It's like minute 70, the match. It, it really, it really screws with you when you have to go only props do this and it's because you have to have have to have that safety yeah so there's special laws that allow for props to come back on even if they've been back off in cases of like somebody being carded or blood subs so you know i'm sure he's had a long career i'm sure he's done it before it's not like it's an experience thing Mm -hmm. it just sucks it sucks you get off the field you get it's not unlike getting carded right like it's a little bit hard to come back from that some players can do it you know, but as a prop who's usually going to be subbed out 60 minutes in to go off, start to cool down, um, have to go back in, it stinks. And then it also it also sucks for Cole Keith because he'd come on. He has to go off. He's also cold and he's going to come in a little bit cold. Right. It really I it really screwed us up. Um, and, and for me, that's where things <clears throat> really start to go south. Um, right. And that's um, minute like fifty nine. That's that's when that penalty is. So it, it, the the last twenty minutes became really challenging. And then the other thing, six minutes later, Pacho is missing that penalty kick. Is it's big. It's those, crucial. It's crucial two, to the end of this game. Yeah, those two misses. You know, we'll we'll talk about more at the end. Yeah. Um, it, but I think they were really important. So that that just that time period from like 59 to 66 we missed some points that were really important to go ahead by more than one score which turned out to be you know to be pretty important we get a prop carded that really jacks up our front row rotation Mm -hmm. um and obviously we're a man down now it was rough and even so we held on pretty well we gave up one scrum penalty in that time it was the time where schultz was like he's tired um he seems to have been correct um but we were actually defending pretty well right Mm -hmm. and even through like even through minute 75 we battered him back we gave up some penalties and they got into like our five meter line they had a five meter line out right yeah they had a five meter line out at like minute 73 and we tackled them all the way back to the half line. It was beautiful to watch. It really was. Yep. It was insane. And it felt like, hell yeah, we yeah. are that good. Right. And then there's that interception, right? Mm-hmm. The 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 Puturangi interception, he has a big breakaway, kind of falls apart at the end. Um, but still, it's a scrum like 10 meters away from their goal line. There's only like three minutes left by the time the ball is actually going to get put in right right cliff just won two free tickets fan of the week. You know, how about that he's he's one of the yeah. big huzzah guys the huzzahs were ripping by the way like oh the yeah best we've ever had they were loud as hell yep. we had to loads of people in it was fantastic so kudos to cliff happy for him he's right there in front in yes. section seven so he is he's the man all is good in the world right we're up by seven 
It's been a little rocky, but we tackled our way out of it. Like legit, right. we tackled our way out of our half. That's insane. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. It is. Yeah. Right. Then we get an interception because that's what defensive pressure does. It generates exactly. opportunities like that. Yep. Um, that's vintage free jacks right there. What you're talking right. about is just our best when we play our best. Yep. And and like we just couldn't finish it. We couldn't finish that breakaway. We need to finish mm -hmm. that breakaway. Maybe it meant just go to ground, keep the ball, recycle it. You know, I mean, that's something that you have to drill into less experienced players you know like right. hey not everything's got to be um not everything's got to be a try on the breakaway you don't always have to make the pass don't force it right don't mm -hmm. i don't know um but even through then like 77 minutes it's like okay all right we just need to close it out we we're doing all right mm -hmm. we got through the card you know we we did give up a try but like we're still ahead we've got this um and then the scrum happens, right? DC mm -hmm. wins a penalty on that scrum. They kick, they get a line out in the middle. Then Sean Ralph knocks it on in their line out. It's a, they, they blew the line out throw. They overthrew it. Yep. And it bounces and he loops around and he just couldn't quite get his hands on it. He knocked it on. So now they've got a scrum right there. Mm -hmm. Their scrum's good. They run phases. Then he gets pinged for not rolling away. And it's all in a few minutes. There were other penalties in there. There was like a penalty to Vian Conradi for a late sack. There was an offsides penalty. There were like six penalties in that time that we committed. Oof. It's just too many. You can't give up six penalties in the yeah. last 20 minutes of a close game and expect to win it. Yeah. So what we're talking about is ill discipline and not being able to finish when we have the opportunity to put these guys away. And what does that mean? That means I get to hang around and the end result is what took place. And we're going to finish it out right here. Uh, when the line-out drive was stalled by Koki Koki Nelligan, um, took it to uh, took it on, but was stopped inches short. William Tanellini was right behind to pick and reach over the line for the try. A tricky angle awaited Robertson with the kick, and the crowd howled to try and shake his focus. Let me just pull sure my mic a little bit closer here for all those people out there that say. Don't say anything or don't make any noise when the kicker's doing his thing. Were you yelling at Fort Quincy in the, in the dying minutes there? Because I know one person who was that is a big advocate for being silent when the kicker, he was like, yeah, hell yeah, I was, I was yelling. So is it situational or is it just, you know, I don't know. Anyway, um, yeah. So uh, a tricky angle awaited Robertson with the kick and the crowd howled to try and uh, shake his focus. But Old Glory... Old Glory's man of the hour paid no mind and slotted the game winner to clinch a famous victory. Both teams return to action next Saturday against Eastern Conference rivals, and both will play at home. New England hosts the first game of the weekend against uh, New Orleans Gold, while D.C. play their first game at Maryland Soccerplex against the Chicago Hounds. So, yeah. Um, end result is a one point loss for our New England Free Jacks, surprising loss. Um, but as we've talked about, ill discipline towards the end, not mm -hmm. putting a team away, letting them hang around. And sometimes this type of result takes place. And, um, you know, DC were really good uh, back in the day when this, this cat, Jason uh, Robertson, was there uh, 10. And then they kind of struggled to replace him, but now he's back. So, uh, by the way, yeah. DC's one of their best players. Like they've got like a holy trinity of good players. There's Robertson, there's Fanona Schultz, and Danny Tusatala hasn't played the past two games. Yeah. So when you think of it that way, two one out of their three best players wasn't even playing in this game, and yet they they stood toe to toe with the New England Free Jacks and then got a one point victory. Um, they're legit, man. That yeah. you know. Uh, I think I had a 10 point victory. Yours was a bit larger of a victory margin than Kenny was even larger that we had on the show <laughs> last week in an interview. But um, DC's Jack's here to play 90. this year, man. Yeah. Jack's by 90. Right. So yeah, they uh, really are, you know, bowed their 15. He's um, good. He's, Canadian. he's legit. Yep. He was, he was covering, uh, <clears throat> spending some time at 10 last year and yep. having both him and Robertson, I think makes them, makes them pretty lethal. Uh, I did think the Free Jacks did a pretty good job of pressuring him on kicks. Conradi lit him up a couple times. Oh, just yeah. really, 
really uh, well timed hits when he was had to be pretty vulnerable to play, to mm-hmm. play, um, you know, uh, receiving some box kicks and things. Um, so that was that was fun to watch. Uh, he suplexed Mitch Wilson. Mitch Wilson got suplexed two times. I hope I hope Dan Bowyer, wrestling super fan, was yes. paying attention. Mitch Wilson got suplexed two times. The WWE better come knocking on his door. No doubt, um, right? Yeah, it was it was spicy. Uh, um, th- there was stuff that was frustrating. You know, thirteen penalties overall, six in the last twenty minutes. It's too much. It's it's too many. We said discipline. You know, managing errors was just really going to be critical here. And yep. you know, if we manage some of those errors, we cut out half of those six penalties. Mm-hmm. We win that game. We probably do. Yep. Um, you know, we missed two crucial kicks at the at the end, not at the end, but in the last twenty again, the last quarter. Yep. Um, we need if he just if he makes one of those, one we of those win the kicks. game. Yeah. yeah, we we need one of those kicks, and we still win. Um, I, I had I was asked by a couple people, you know, like what's up with what's up with the kicking, right? What's up with Patros missing kicks? And here's here's my opinion. Mm. Um, right, two matches is not a lot of data right right this is this is a pretty small sample size really when you zoom out and think about like what really makes up a kicking statistics you know you're looking at seasons yeah um is so what are the possibility possible explanations for for potter's missing a bunch of kicks last week and missing half the kicks this week um you know so so one possibility is that Jason Padres, the you know MLR champion, uh, NPC champion, mm-hmm. fly half MVP has just forgotten how to kick, right? No. Just just is bad at kicking now. Nope. I think that's I think that's pretty unlikely. Yeah. Um, another possibility is that he's um, you know getting older or has an injury that's that's affecting him. That's possible, but I think it's it's pretty unlikely. We don't really have any other supporting evidence. It's not like think about Waka and how heavily strapped up his his right leg. I think it was his right leg usually was mm-hmm. by yep. season 2 that he was with the Free Jacks. You know, in yep. those cases, yeah, okay, you got some corroborating evidence. Maybe there's an injury that's affecting things. It doesn't see I haven't noticed anything that would suggest that for Patros. Um a third possibility is that it's a statistical anomaly. You're gonna mm-hmm. miss a certain number of kicks. He's about an eighty percent kicker. He's not like a incredible automatic every time. You know, super. Nobody is. Nobody is. Kicker. Nobody is. Nobody is. I mean, there are a few kickers who are outliers in that way, right? Mm-hmm. Who are just like, man, it's insane. This guy really never misses. Um, but Padres is a very capable kicker. I think last year he was around eighty percent for the season. Okay. Um, which is where you want that's you know where you want your kicker to be. It's eighty or higher, right? Mm-hmm. That's your if you're below that, you're really you're really hurting and you're leaving too many points on the board. But you can't make a hundred, and if you're above eighty, you're doing well. And he's always clocked in there, you mm-hmm. know. Um, I really think that it's probably just like a run of bad luck. I mean, so other those aren't the only possibilities. It could be a form thing that's off, right? And it yeah. like needs needs coaching correction. I'm the last person on earth you could look at for that. I have no idea. Will Webster's responsible for that, our, our guy. Yeah. You know, um, I, I mean, it, it's, it's not an exhaustive list, but like to me, those are like the things that come to mind first. If people have mm-hmm. other ideas, you know, let me know. I think it's just, I think it's a statistical anomaly. Uh, uh, unlikely things group. You can discriminate. Um, real random data from fake random data by looking at the groupings real random data has way more groupings and weird regularities than fake random data because when people do fake random data they like try to make it extra random and perfectly spread out and there's not clumps you know um and and there's clumps in real data and Mm -hmm. i think this is just a clump i think it's a clump of misses um, and it's unlikely to continue. I'm really not panicked about it at all. It sucks that we lost a match, and that one reason was was several missed kicks. Um, but I'm not having a crisis of confidence. We Same. can see other kickers taking some kicks in the future. You know, maybe... we know Reese McDonald, Mitch Wilson, yep. uh, John Poland. Uh, there's a lot of guys that can kick. 
Yep. So, and it's not uncommon, and it would not be a big deal if the team starts maybe using more. Um, that would certainly be, again, statistically informed, right? It would be a choice based on players percentages from different field positions think like nba shooting maps right yeah like it, it would be that kind of a decision it wouldn't just be like a gut oh well we need another person like it, <laughs> he it looks good very, today in warm-ups we're gonna let right. him. <laughs> i'm sure it would be very tactical and analytical but it, yeah it, and, and so it would be interesting it would be something interesting to note but i it, it don't think it would be super meaningful right um i just wouldn't be surprised to see maybe a small change like that on the back of this but yeah. like i said i i'm really not worried about uh jason patro's kicking at this point we need mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. data before we start like oh weird this is you know this is we're not just talking about seven misses across a few games which is anomalous but you know yeah. whatever we're talking about four games five games where we've seen yeah. we've seen it a lot it's early, I think, is really yeah. something to keep in mind. It's way early, guys. Like this was week two. We're going into week three now. So let, let's let's let it play out. I mean, they need yeah. to clean up the the discipline issues and and the uh, the error issues yeah. that really bit them in this game. And and you could argue against Charlotte as well. I mean, it, that's when it really uh the, it opened our eyes to the issues. And we talked about it in the the key to the game. Mm -hmm. And obviously that was not followed. And the result was a one point loss against uh, our little brothers down there in D.C. Yeah. Um, uh, one um, of our yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say that it. I think it felt a little bit like losing to the Free Jacks feel, feels, or felt before we won a championship. Is that because we uh, we have we, we have the same colors? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. Yeah, but yeah, our yeah. red uniforms look way better than theirs. Hundred um, percent. All our uniforms look better than theirs. Oh yeah. Uh it's they just kept up pressure. Right, they yeah. refused to quit competing. How many matches have we seen the Free Jacks win like that? And I mean, I'm talking so go, go back a few years, right? Early yeah. days of the show, you know, boy, these guys just wouldn't quit. They kept fighting. You know, they didn't quite make it. They didn't didn't quite get to the playoffs. Didn't quite win the playoffs. You know, those early days when they weren't quite there, they were still coming into their own. This mm -hmm. is what they did, right? They right. played hard to the whistle. They didn't stop competing. They would beat teams. They, they could be losing the whole time, and they didn't give a shit. They just kept competing. Yeah. And if the other team made errors or couldn't handle the pressure, um, they would pull out a win. And that's what that's what happened to us this week. And I think a big part of it is winning a championship. We have you know we have a target on our back, right? Yeah. Like, but it's true, people, it especially is. in home matches. I think especially people coming in to Fort Quincy, mm -hmm. now that they know it's got a reputation, it's got a nickname, we've got a shield, we've only lost a very small number of times at home, people want to add their name to that list. And we can mm -hmm. expect other teams to do the same. And I think that, you know, we're not in the NOLA preview section yet, but <laughs> I think we can expect NOLA to come in hot next week as well. Right. Absolutely. Uh, real quickly here, uh, Ranger Andrew says he's got three things to review. Um, every time the Free Jacks were up by 10 plus points, the referee would give out a phantom scoring penalty to DC. It was the only way they got points the whole game. Any comments on that? A phantom scoring penalty? That's what he says, yeah. Um, no, I mean, I didn't dig into the other seven penalties that made up the 13 penalties. Mm -hmm. I really focused on the end of the game. Sure. Um, so, but in that time, they were all legit penalties. Yeah. Like, you can't blame the ref if you did it. Here's right. something that I heard in the stands as I was leaving. Uh, you know, the, the referee was the, the MVP of uh, D.C. And this one, the yeah. second point here, the number of high tackles ignored by the referee, I believe there were at least a dozen. I saw six in a row during one phase of play towards the end. Did you pick up on that at all? I wasn't really looking for high tackles, no. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know it was something he was on early. I thought Ben Lesage did a really good job responding to that warning, actually. He didn't sure. need any further action after that. Um, I did, I mean, I knew with the number of penalties, I said to my I said to my friend David, who I was in the stands with, and said, people are going to be really mad at Scott Green. Yeah. Like, 
it's I I do think it's natural to have that reaction. I was annoyed, and I'm sitting there going like, these are probably right. I'm gonna look later. I don't. I mean, my my perspective from the stands in those moments is like, I can't see that breakdown well enough to know if that penalty is warranted or not. Sure. Yeah. Like truly, there's no way to call that. You're talking about professional athletes doing marginally illegal things most of the time. You're like. <laughs> You're not really going to be able to catch it from the stands. High tackles are are different, you know, like that's usually pretty obvious. Um, yeah, those are those are easy to spot to generally. Closer analysis, but you can yeah. at least call the ones that are borderline. Right. Um, but, you know, breakdown, I mean the penalties we got were an offsides penalty, an no arms off t- feet tackle penalty, a scrum penalty, a late sack of the line out. That was one that I thought was like maybe maybe a little bit harsh. Mm-hmm. But also, when you've given up, let's see, at that point, there were only two left to go, so that was penalty number 11. When you've given up 10 penalties 70 minutes in, you're not going to get the marginal calls anymore. No. It's not going right. to happen. We exactly. talk about it on this show a lot, right? Like, it's once you are presenting a certain um, mentality to the referee, it's just going to get worse. If yep. like, you, have to be, you have to be extra careful. Um, and, it is, and it is on you. Like it's, it's part of the game. Yeah, that, it is. That, yeah. And, and he was, I actually thought Scott Green was pretty damn fair. And he at several points could have given cards and did not. Could have carded Poland when he intentionally knocked it there. One hand. Yeah, knocked. right. Now I forgot did, about that. Yeah, you're did, right. Did Poland think that he, um, did Poland think that he could, uh, intercept? intercept that pass yes like i but it doesn't it doesn't really matter if you knock it on with one hand you're probably you're going to be penalized Mm -hmm. right and if if the referee wants to or thinks it was cynical right you're going to be carded for it like it is a very cardable offense because it is something that's so easy to fake intent is taken out of it Right. Mm-hmm. Oh, I was going for the intercept. I mean, it's literally what they say every, every single time. time. I was yeah. trying to intercept it. And it's true, but it doesn't matter. You have to make a better judgment call, right? Yes. And so, like, Poland's going for the intercept. He doesn't quite make it. He knocks down with one hand. Could have carded him. He didn't. He gave – how many times did Scott Green say, you're on a warning? You're on a warning. <laughs> he didn't need to keep giving warnings. <laughs> he could have given cards. He was doing everything he could to avoid deciding the match with cards. Mm-hmm. And he still had to give out a card. Like, yeah. But, I mean, two of them. But, like, he tried. There were warnings. Um, you know, it was, it was a breakdown. Uh, there is one thing that was a little bit weird, which is how the final try was scored. I almost didn't even want to mention it. Um, it so... In the ruck, if you're in the ruck, to play the ball, you have to unbind from the ruck mm-hmm. and then and then play the ball. Sure. And when you unbind from the ruck, you have to have both feet behind the ball. Oh, this is that uh this is that uh, Austin play coming back uh to haunt yeah. us, right? Yeah, yep. Interesting. All right, let's hear yep. it. <laughs> so you have to have both feet behind the ball if you're in the ruck and you want to play it. If you're not in the ruck, you think about the scrum half coming in to play the ball at most yes. breakdowns, yeah. um, especially old fashioned, right? Big old swing and step over the ball. So now you got a one foot in front of the ball, one foot behind the ball, and then pitch it out, maybe even dive, right? Mm-hmm. And throw a big old pass. Um, that's legal because you're not in the ruck. The scrum half isn't in the right. ruck. He's just Correct. arriving at the ruck to play the ball. So he yes. can put a foot in front of it. But if you are in the ruck, if you are competing at the ruck, then if you want to play the ball, you have to unbind from the ruck to do it, which makes mm-hmm. sense. Yep. So you have to you have to exit the ruck. And when you do that, both feet have to be behind the ball. Right? Because if they're not, what you could do is say, hover over a ball as you're in the ruck, work one foot forward so that it's in line with the ball or even in front of it. It's genuinely mm-hmm. hard to tell from the camera angle, which is why I wasn't going to mention it because it looks <laughs> marginal. Okay. Yeah. I'm not really confident. His foot's really in front of it. It might just be right in line with it, but he then picks it up, moves it about a foot forward mm-hmm. and puts it down. There's no bodies in between him and where he puts it down because they're rucking him. 
Right. It's Wayne Vanderbank. Ah, uh, yep. And uh, uh, Cam. I think Cam it's, I think it's, yeah. I think it's yeah, Cam it came Cam. back yeah. on when the card ended, right? Yeah. Um, they're rucking him, right? They're, and so he doesn't really drive forward with his legs so much as just pick up the ball, move that forward, and collapse straight That's down right. from yep. the weight. Uh, you know, he just kind of lets lets it all collapse and moves the ball forward. They don't ever let go of him as he's like working his arm out and like gets his arm loose so that he can play the ball. Um, they never unbind from him, and so as far as I understand it, and I may have a gap in my understanding, he's still in the ruck and he can't really play that ball. Um, and even if he can, his foot's like in front of it, and it's kind of weird. Now doesn't matter because we gave up six penalties in right. that time we shot ourselves in the foot and we cannot blame the referee mm -hmm. for that but if you watch the footage as soon as the try scored wayne vanderbank puts his hands up like what that's the right hell was yeah that? yes you know that's not legal he's in the ruck and he just picks it up and moves it forward um it's the sort of thing where if you watch it you're like yeah why don't they just do that right and if your reaction to a play is like, yeah, why don't you just do that every time? That's kind of a clue that you're not supposed to do that, mm -hmm, right? Because mm -hmm. it's it's not supposed to be that easy to score a try that far, you know, that close to the line. You can't just like ruck and burrow your way close enough to pick up the ball right. and move it forward. So it would really be a hands in the ruck penalty right? because and he never exited the ruck. Like if, if, Scott if my read and that, what I'm presenting is correct. Right then that's that's i think is what it would be is very a, is interesting hands in the ruck yep and if he calls that the free jacks win that penalty and then kick it out and the game's over in that yeah, scenario correct. yeah right. right um so it's not a pick and go it's not a classic pick and go because he was engaged in the ruck he unbinds right. and it's possible that his foot his feet were in yeah. front of the ball when and he the, en engages and he does engage. It's not like he goes to play the ball and they pull him in or because that's a possibility, right? And if they had mm -hmm. like reached out and pulled him in, I wouldn't be saying like, oh, he's, you know, he's in the ruck because that'd be, you know, that's kind of cynical. Whatever. Yeah. You can't you can't reach out and grab a guy's jersey to stop him from having the right to play the ball, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not what happens. He comes in and hits the ruck and then he has to like work his arm out. You can see him kind of shaking, like his back sort of twists back and forth, and that's him okay. working his right arm loose, I'm pretty sure, and getting it down onto the ball as he's stepping his left foot forward and getting ready, and then just picks it up and drops and, and you know gets gets it over the line that way. Gotcha. Um, it, it's certainly a hell of a way to lose a rugby game. But, uh, it is. Like I said, I, I, I don't say any of that to, to – blame scott green and i'm certainly not no. trying to supply ammunition to anybody who's 100 percent the referees but i am somebody who finds you know the laws to be interesting and if you know more about that situation than i do maybe you're a referee maybe you're just a huge dork you know reach out comment i know i'm curious and and, and we'd like to hear it uh i'm always trying to learn more about the laws of rugby so if there's some reason that i'm wrong in that read by all means let us know Send us an email at jacksrangersshow at gmail.com. Uh, final point from Andrew is, did we ever get an explanation as to why there was so much stoppage besides the referee, referee giving DC time to score the winner? I think this is just a very good educational moment about um, stoppage time uh, like and the, the referee the time, time keeping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the problem is that we, we kept – uh, we kept the ball wasn't going dead. We were committing penalties right. after after full time. So when it's at 80 minutes, the game doesn't end until the ball goes dead by crossing, you know, a touch line and going into touch, crossing the dead ball line and the, you know, the back of the end goal area mm -hmm. um, being knocked on. Um, although obviously you can't intentionally knock it because that would be a penalty. Otherwise, what a wonderful, cynical way to end the game. Oh, I knocked it on. Well, too bad. Right. That's the last play. Um <laughs> Uh, so the ball has to go dead in some way and you and necessitating a restart, right? Yeah. A line out or a scrum or a 22 drop or a, you know, what any of the goal line drop, the various like normal restart mm -hmm. ways, not a penalty. This was changed a couple years ago um, because you could commit a penalty and the game would end. And that's kind of weird, right? Yeah. So they said, well, if you commit a penalty, um, 
well, the the game wouldn't end. You could quick tap and keep the game alive, but if you kicked to touch, the ball would go dead and the game would end. That's right. And they said, well, that doesn't seem quite fair because that means that the last penalty of the game is, you know, much more is adjudicated very differently than every other penalty in the game. We take mm -hmm. away this kick to touch option. So they had said, well, from now on, with the game, when the game ends, um, or when the, when it's full time rather, if there's a penalty and you kick to touch, the game doesn't end. You have the lineup. You get you get to keep going, um, which means if you have a penalty and you want the game to end, all you have the other team has to be back ten meters, right? So all you have to do is just you know tap the ball and then kick it out. You can still right. end the game if you want to if it's your penalty. It's very easy. Um, although it does introduce the wonderful possibility of you know really screwing up and having everyone on your team mad at you because you like knocked it on when you were trying to just end the game. Yeah, um, uh, which is super you know, rare, but it good. happens. Yeah. yeah, super. You know, just just a little bit of, of possibility. Um, but if you kick to touch, you're going to have the line out. So it was at 80 minutes. The clock had gone over. The problem is that at that point, um, you know, there's the scrum around minute 80. Um, Sean Ralph doesn't roll away. He gets sent off. They kick to the to touch for another line out because time is over, but they could do that. They can have their line out. Jackson Thevis reaches over the top of the mall and kind of rolls out the back of it with the ball. I'm thinking this is an illegal mall entry from him or maybe like change your mind. I don't know what Scott Green, you know, called in the moment. Mm -hmm. But um, I do think that you know that that's a penalty um at that point they get to kick for touch again and have a line out again and that's what they do so that's that's why that keeps happening um is because we keep giving them penalties which lets them uh keep it alive you know like you said we we didn't close it out really all we needed was just to be a little bit more disciplined in that time, not give away those couple penalties. They're not yeah. rolling away the illegal entry. It's it, not just those. We gave away lots. Like I'm not trying to single out any one thing. It's the, it's the collective of sure. all of these mistakes that really cost us. Yeah. Um, but it continued even after 80 minutes. That's why it kept going. We just could not get out of our own way when it came to infringing around like the breakdown and the set piece. I mean, this team almost beat us last year due to ill discipline as well. So they finally got yeah. one over on us uh, in, in the home opener last year. It, it got a little bit of a squeaky bum time situation there. We had two yellow cards that became a red for the pest, Jesse Peretti. And, you know, there was just a lot of ill discipline. And, and they, they finally got us. They finally got us. It took over a thousand days, but uh, D.C. was the victor. Over the Free Jacks, um, any calls for concerns for lineouts? Um, in your opinion, yeah, uh, it hasn't been great. Um, I think it definitely needs to improve. Uh, they are, you know, no uh, notoriously hard to dial in and all that. You know, it is. There's a lot of timing. Uh, I say it that way because I don't want. I'm not trying to make excuses. Uh, our lineout definitely needs to be better. Yep. Um, but I'm more concerned about the scrum after this week. I think the scrum was the disruption caused by the card. I don't yeah. think, like, again, like, Cole Keith is a damn good scrummager. I don't think that he forgot how to scrummage this week. I think it was probably the, the card situation, and then, you know, that just really, it really throws everything mm -hmm. off. Um, the other, the other, the opposing scrum gets to kind of eat lunch the whole time. You're out, like, they're, they're just generating all this pressure that gives you all this momentum, all this, you know, psychic energy into every scrum mm -hmm. that you're bringing in there. Just like absolutely railed. We are going to destroy these guys. And that stuff matters. hundred um, percent. So I'm, I, I hope the scrum's okay. I think it's going to be fine, but that's, I'm a little bit more worried about that um, than the line out just based on what happened in the match, not based on like personnel. I was really, yeah. I gave, I gave him, I gave the front row an A. I was like really confident about the person. You were. And, and listen, hope, if you, I hope I'm right. I think, I I'm think right, you so. are. I think, I think you bad, are. I think it's a bad match in a bad situation, but we'll, you know, we'll see. I agree. Um, yeah. We, we have the ponies to compete. That, that That's not the concern. Uh, that, that, that absolutely is not the concern. This roster should and could beat every single team in this league. Like on paper, that that's not the issue. That, that we don't have a talent deficit here in New England. Point blank, period. 
You know, teams can, you know, have some fears and come up and have belief and, and, you know, go toe to toe with us. But that doesn't mean that there's some sort of talent deficiency here in New England. That doesn't exist. Um, Period. So let's get over to um, musket size pants tent real quick. Uh, It's the hooker for me. Um, It is Martine. um, Vaca. Vaca, baby. 22 year old uh, hooker from Argentina, six foot two, 235 pounds, Argentinian, under 20s. Uh, He played for them in the 2021 uh, era there that year. He played for the Jaguars, uh, 15 in 2021 as well. And he's been playing in the French Division II and Division III with Rossing Club Nabonis for the past two seasons. Kid bagged himself a hat trick and looked very impressive doing it. Great young player for DC. I will also point out, I think it was their 12 or 13. He is dangerous with ball in hand. Like he kept breaking that game line left and right, baby. Yeah. Was it uh, uh, Boney, looked... the guy with the big hair? Yes, that was him. Boney. Yeah. yeah, he's good, man. So, yeah. Uh, uh, Inkavai MVP, and I'll let you go first. Um, I'm going to politely request that you go first. On oh, MVP, shit. Because I may right. audible mine. It's uh, tough to pick a standout when we win sometimes, and it's really tough to pick a standout when we lose. But I'm going to give this one to the first try score of at Fort Quincy in 2024 that both you and I picked, uh, and we were correct, uh, returning straight into the starting lineup after missing last week. King, Paula Bellincana, all hell the king. He's my MVP. Absolutely. He played a pretty solid match. It was very exciting to watch him score that try. Absolutely. I like being I like being right. It feels good. <laughs> Same. Um, I said it in the stands. I was like, we picked him. But we, you know. I spent the whole match talking to my buddy Wes about Ben Lesage and how I was gonna mm. pick him for my MVP. Mm-hmm. And I think he had a really good match. And I wanna I wanna give him credit. His All work right. rate was really good. Um he finished a nice try. Watch how fast he gets up and back in the line when he makes a tackle. At one point, he made a tackle like on one 15 meter line, right? Like, think of it as like the back of the line out area, yep. right? That yep. 15 meter line on one side. And then he like springs up. Like, I think you can literally see him jump up at the back mm-hmm. of the ruck, mm-hmm. like with excitement and sprints all the way to the other end, gets in line, like rolls his shoulders, and then just like, is forward and makes another tackle. It's super phenomenal. fit. Yeah. He had a great game. The guy lives to defend, which yeah. you really want in a 13. Absolutely. Um, and then I looked at the stats for the game. Wayne Vanderbank also played a really good active game. Yep. Um, he is a fun player to watch. He made 23 tackles. Whoa. 23 that is crazy ben lesage made 14 and i noticed like man ben lesage is really putting in defensive work today 23 tackles from wayne that's crazy man the guy is a machine um he had eight carries Uh, he just i think he put in a, a solid match uh 96 running meters like he was good in attack he was amazing in defense, just crazy work rate. And I, you know, I try to try to be the stats guy. I, I always am interested and in try to try to be informed by stats. And this is a case where I feel mm-hmm. like I would have to abdicate my stats guy crown if uh, I did not pick 23 tackles. That's crazy. Six running meters, Wayne Vanderbank for my MVP. So I am going to. I'm going to give it to Wayne Vanderbank and accept the consequences that that will mean for me with my friend Wes. You know what, man? Like both of those guys, the honorable mission, Ben Lesage, boardroom Benny, as we like to call him around here, um, a great friend of the show, great player. But Wayne Vanderbank, uh, another friend of the show, by the way, quick story about Wayne. I know we're over an hour into the the review, which I think is the <laughs> longest we've review. ever done. Yeah. We've ever done. Um, Wayne Vanderbank. When his introductory interview was taking place, he was like, I'm going to be at a wedding. And I was like, okay, you still want to do it? He's like, yeah, absolutely. I'm pretty sure, Dave, I'm pretty sure it was his wedding. He did the show. No He interviewed way. on this show. And I think it was his fucking wedding, which is completely, I didn't know. If that was the case, if I had known that, I would have never right. said, like, just have fun. Mortified, like, right? Just like. 100%. 
we could do it another time. I promise. Wayne Vanderbank did this show on his wedding day. That's whether it's true or not. That's true. <laughs> What a guy. One of my favorite players. And last year, you know, he was injured, didn't get selected a lot. People forgot how good he was. People were sleeping on Wayne Vanderbank, and you're making a mistake. The guy is unreal. You're talking about the tackle, the defensive rate. How about he doesn't get tackled in that? That first tackler has no chance of tackling him. I don't care who it is. You're not going to tackle Wayne Vanderbank in your first attempt. you got to get a second or third guy in there to tackle him. He's unstoppable at times. Love that dude. So happy for him. Uh, to see him back in the starting lineup. Yeah, um, it sucks that we lost. Um, We haven't really talked about that in terms of the emotional suckiness of that. Um, Just real quick, you know, I'm so glad that I, because I was leaving, uh, me and Miss TJRS were just walking out, and I was like, yeah, I don't feel good about that. I want to talk to the players. So we walked back onto the pitch, talked to a couple players, talked to some, uh, all of the coaches, um, first thing a couple players said to me, they looked the dead in the eyes and said, I'm so sorry. And I was oh, like, brutal, 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 right? I, no I lack really of effort. I mean, it, I mean, exactly. we certainly can't question the desire or the effort that, you know, that's at no point did we mention that in the, this episode, right? It's, right. It's just, dis- it's, it was a discipline and execution exactly. issue, not a, yeah. not a belief it's, issue, not a, not a, effort not a talent issue, a not an effort. Yeah. Yeah, none of that was factored into this loss. It's just a matter of you got to you got to clean up that discipline. Yeah. You can't keep uh, teams like DC hanging around like that because they'll bite you yeah. in the ass. And they did. It was it was really nice to see uh, Quentin now Chris newcomer um, yeah, after the match. Ch- I mean, you know, he just wants to, it'll happen. Wants to yeah. Go by Chris. That's fine. Um, but it's funny because I just call him Quentin first each time. Uh, yeah. It was great to see him again. He's there holding his holding this little baby. You know, I welcomed him back and, and congratulated him. I'm sure it felt I'm sure it felt pretty fantastic for him to roll in with his new team and 100%. Pick, up, pick up one of those rare Quincy wins. So kudos. He to said him. something to you. He said something to me, and he also messaged me on Instagram. Oh man! And was like, I can't wait to see the mate the meme on Monday. And that's exactly what he told me in person. And I was like, man, we're on to New Orleans. Like, what do you want me to do here? That was last week, man. Like, right, right. rival week is over until it happens in June. Like, you know, we, this is we're at the beginning of the season. We got to keep it rolling, baby. So, yeah, yeah man, um, good for him. Good for I've them. Got, I've got an idea. I've got an idea for you. All right. I'll, I'll try to help you solve your problem. Love that. Um, is that it? I think that's it, man. I think we're done. Yeah, it's uh, an hour and seven minutes. I'm glad that I talked to Wes, your buddy, our buddy, yeah. on the pitch because he had a great perspective of it. Like, you, by the way, we lost. Good loss. Uh, we, yeah, good loss, right? Is what he said. And when that's I hear he that said, immediately, I'm loss. thinking, but he made a lot of sense. Make a lot of sense. Errors. We lost in I week mean, two last year, and look how that turned out. Yep. Just saying. Just saying. All right, we got to get out of here. Uh, in three. Two, one, huzzah! Huzzah!